I only like to give the maximum in everything I do. The, the maximum I have, I can give. Well, I think you revolutionized climbing by being a visionary. I am not perfect, but I, if I do something, I do it best in that second. And this, many people are not made like this. There are only a few, but I like this few. He had this vision and these ideas about climbing in ways that people had never thought of before. Climbing Everest without oxygen, people thought that could not be done. He's arguably the greatest climber of all time. I think that the whole evolution in climbing has to do with the approach, the mental approach to the impossible. If we kill the impossible with technical equipment, with sophisticated technical equipment, climbing will be gone forever. I know that it's possible to climb Everest without, with oxygen, but nobody knows if it's possible to climb Everest without oxygen. In 1977, Reinhold Messner had already stunned the world by being the first to summit an 8,000-meter peak without using bottled oxygen, when he flew up in a depressurized plane over Everest without an oxygen mask. For Messner, it was a survival test at 30,000 feet in preparation for two climbs that would cement his reputation as the greatest climber and the greatest revolutionary climber of modern times. Seeing alpinism as a joke, it's interesting to try this climb without oxygen. I would never come here for trying Everest with oxygen. It's not important for me. It's, it's not a challenge for me. I'm doing this alpinism, this climbing in high altitude for knowing myself. It's not more important to explore the mountains. Exploring the mountains may be necessary when Hillary and Tenzing climbed the first time Everest. But in the meanwhile, the whole mountains in Himalaya, in Karakorum, also in Patagonia, they are explored and it's not important for the human world to explore them. What's important to explore myself. And if I put some important technical thing between me and the mountains, I have never the possibility to know myself, to explore myself. Messner did not view mountaineering as being about conquest. He viewed it as seeking what he called the heart of adventure, seeking the unknown, in a world in which technology could too easily erase the unknown and extinguish adventure. But he had barely gotten up on Everest when the mountain unleashed a very powerful unknown of its own and minus 40 degree temperatures, while lightning slashed down the mountain around them. Mesner returned 36 hours later after spending two nights in the storm, two nights in the death zone without oxygen. His climbing partner, Peter Habler, had descended alone back to Camp 2 and had nearly gotten lost in the blizzard, where he certainly would have died. Habler began to have second thoughts about climbing Everest without bottled oxygen, doubts made worse after he talked to a party that had just come back from the summit. When the first summit party uh, came back, Robert Schauer told me that Whenever he took, he took his mask sometimes, down sometimes, you know, his, his oxygen, ox, oxygen mask, and he was completely, he was dizzy, you know. He didn't know what to say, he didn't know what to think. And this made me thinking, and I was fighting against it. And I was almost uh, ready and willing to use oxygen, not to lose my brain, to be normal, to ju just go up and have a nice time, sit maybe one hour there and took some nice, uh, take, take some nice pictures. And I have only to tell him, Peter, you have done this and this and this and this. If I can do it, if also you can do it, I'm sure. Now show them that you can do Everest without oxygen. So Mesner and Habler set out, knowing that severe altitude sickness, brain seizures and hemorrhages and fatal blood clots were among the perils that climbers at far lesser altitudes often suffer. Brain damage, even madness, was not ruled out. The expedition cameraman, in fact, was unable to continue, forcing Mesner himself to shoot this film of their historic ascent of Everest.
Reinhold got up the, fir the uh, Hitler step first and filmed. It's a, maybe the most exposed place on Earth, down to Tibet and on the left hand side, uh, down to Nepal. And I got up that part. Reinhold didn't belay me, he was just filming. And then I got, got up to him and he did continue. In short time he reached the summit and he was sitting there beside the Chinese pole and I, I just remember seeing him and in the last moment I thought well we are going to make it and the pain became excruciating my first fear was that I was going blind well this was quite bad but I was very lucky because uh, on the way up I did the whole filming and also the photographing we had very high sun uh, shining, but above the clouds. So the, the sun came from the clouds and also from the sky and from the snow. And I had my goggles always down for filming, photographing. And on the summit, I had no problems. And I didn't feel anything on the way down. And I climbed down normally and thinking maybe I, got, I lost my eye for the fact that I was in high altitude. After a while, we understood that it should be snow blindness because the, the pains were terrible. Next day, I could see only a shadow of Peter. So we had not to go on a road, but he, I always had to say, Peter, stop, because if I lose you, I don't know where to go. The world would compare them to Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. But Mesner would describe this comparison. Their ambition was to stand on the summit. Mine was an adventure towards spiritual and ethical self-examination. We both succeeded. Hillary with his summit, and I with a new measure of myself. Two years later, Mesner would attempt to climb Everest without bottled oxygen, alone. In 1984, the great German film director Werner Herzog made a film about Mesner entitled the dark low of the mountains. In it, Mesner gave perhaps the clearest explanation of the revolution he brought to mountaineering. A traditional expedition attempting to climb this mountain, or both, would have porters to transport a ton or two of equipment and supplies. It would be made by a large number of members, set up high altitude camps with many tents, and with the climbers moving back and forth from tent to tent, camp to camp, would eventually form a pyramid with the strongest making it to the peak. We, on the other hand, climb alpine style. We use the rope if we have to, to go down rock faces or to cross crevasses. But for the most part, we climb everything freestyle, without rope. I brought a revolution, maybe, which was only possible with the uh, philosophy of the clean climbing, which came in the same period from the Yosemite Valley. I think that the philosophers Tom Frost, um, Royal Robbins, uh, they, uh, in the same period, understood we have to change something. And they did it in the Yosemite Valley. I did not either know that this existing then. Yosemite Valley was not known in Europe. I did not know anything about Royal Robbins or Tom Frost or Ivan Schoenart, these are the, the heroes of this period. And I did it here. And I understood that it has to do with impossible. Quite early, I understood if we destroy the impossible with technical aids. So climbing will be gone because climbing is a metamorphosis in our head of the impossible. And for having the infinite possibility to change the impossible in our mind, only in our mind, because outside is changing anything, nothing is changing, uh, it will be over. And the best climbers uh, were always they were able to say, this is possible. Everybody before said, this is impossible. But once somebody came and said, this is possible. This film about young climbers challenging the impossible in Yosemite could have been made about Messner and the Dolomites, 5,000 miles away in northern Italy. 
in the 60s. I began to do the big solo climbs in 67, but a few, 68. And in 69, I was in my best form in rock and ice climbing in the Alps. And I did the most difficult rock climb of the Alps, solo without a rope. And all the climbers, they spoke badly about it. They said, you will be dead in a few weeks and this is crazy what you're doing. And maybe young people are following you and they will all die. And I did also in this summer the, the most difficult combined rocket ice uh, route in the Mont Blanc. Again, without a rope, without anything. And the quickest, they needed three days. And it was a rumor going on, this route is so difficult that everybody will have a fall. And I went up alone without a rope and I did it in seven hours. I went up, I climbed up, like fishes are swimming and birds are flying. I would be not at least dreaming about to do it today because my abilities are gone. I'm, I'm doing different things. High altitude is a different thing. There you need willpower, you need a strong mental preparation, but climbing, it's, it's not difficult there, like in the, in the Dolomites or somewhere or in Yosemite Valley. The technical climbing may be easier in the Himalayas, but for Mesner, the psychological challenges were strikingly more important to him than the physical challenges he confronted. When I did the solo ascents on the Himalaya peaks, I had the necessity to show to myself that I'm able to do also what I did with my partners, with my friends, alone. Technically, it's not more difficult, especially in high altitude. It's only a psychological question. It's a question of mind. And I needed a long time to learn to stay for weeks up there in the high places, all by my own, without being afraid, especially for the fact that I am alone. The solo climbing became a necessity for the fact I have problems to be alone. It's not so easy for me to be alone for days in the mountains. And in the 60s, when I was a good rock climber, fanatic rock climber, I would say, I was always understanding that it's very difficult for me to do these solo climbs. I knew I can do them because I have the ability, but it was quite impossible for me to climb a whole day and to sleep in the, in the, in the, in the wall and climb uh, uh, further next day because I was so afraid in the night. Being there alone in, in some cave high up, I was afraid. And so it came this necessity in all my activities. I did something alone. Solo climbing is only possible if you are on your best of your, of your physical stage, mental stage, and you feel, I can do it. If you are afraid, you should not do it. And I needed a long time to learn to, to do it because I had this small problem to, to be in troubles being alone, but not for the difficulties, only for the fact that I had nobody to tell him, OK, we are great today, we do it. Or uh, looking in his eyes and understanding he understands it's quite dangerous what we are doing. So danger is only half if you divide danger with another one. And uh, if you divide your joy on the summit, it's double joy. And if you're alone, you cannot divide anything. You have to handle it by yourself not knowing where you go, not knowing how the weather will be, not knowing where you sleep. You have to carry food, you have to carry uh, a tent, you have to carry a sleeping bag, you have to carry especially also burning material, gasoline or gas, to melt snow. So you have a heavy, heavy rucksack. And you need uh, a day. If you need two days, you have a heavier rucksack. And if you go in, in the wilderness, in, in, in the places where you don't know what's happening because it's a first ascent, so maybe you calculate 10 days and you can imagine how heavy is the rucksack and the, the snow is maybe deep, no, no trail there, you have to do the trail. And so it's a different thing. And for this I say, like Krakow was saying, I like him in, in his book, uh, Into Thin Air. Climbing has to do with self-invention. You invent the route. You invent the, how you go up. Add to the psychological challenge of climbing alone, the physical challenge of climbing without bottled oxygen, and you understand the depth of his self-examination and the depth of his achievement. I mean, some people say they've done a solo climb of Everest, but there's been other people around. There's a huge difference. Psychologically, there's a, a big difference when you're completely alone, and that's what he was trying to, to see. What was that like? Ed Viesters is the only American to have summited the six highest peaks in the world without using bottled oxygen. 
Climbing without oxygen is very, very difficult. It totally changes what happens at high altitude. When you're climbing with oxygen, you stay warmer, you think more clearly, you move faster. Without oxygen, you really have to will yourself and force yourself to just keep moving at those altitudes. And I think it's been shown that Messner had relatively normal physiology. He wasn't like this phenomenal physiological specimen, but he had this mental drive that pushed him far beyond what he should have been able to do. The passion for limits, I think this is the best title for my uh, activity. Passion for limits, always going a step further on, on the limit of the possible, my personal limits. When you're in the death zone above, you know, 24,000 feet, your body is slowly kind of consuming itself. So you're kind of climbing on borrowed time. The lack of oxygen means you think slower, you can't process as quickly. You are slowly losing your mind and afterwards it's coming back. Uh, being in high altitude without oxygen for a long time, really high up, if you see somebody you know, maybe this is this person, you can see yourself thinking very, very slowly. It needs willpower to do a small uh, sentence again. Your thought processes are slower, your, your motivation is depressed. I mean, just to go and put your boots on takes 20 minutes of thinking and then another half an hour of doing, and, and then you're like exhausted. In Cortina, Italy, the climbing center of the Dolomites, guide Mario De Bona has just returned from summiting Everest without oxygen. Dopo 7,000 metri, diciamo che tu fai fatica a respirare perché essendo meno ossigeno, tu devi sempre richiamare l'aria. Perciò devi sempre concentrarti e, e inalare sempre bene. Perciò eh, il problema forse più grosso è quello di dormire perché alla sera non riesci a dormire, perché ti svegli e devi richiamare l'ossigeno dentro. Devi stare sveglio, devi stare eh, no dormire e continuare a respirare. In the summer of 1980, Reinhold Messner returned to Everest to attempt the unthinkable, climbing it solo without oxygen. To the Everest, I had three weeks to acclimatize. It was enough. I was quite well acclimatized. I made the first uh, assault, and at 7,000 meters, the snow was so wet, and it was so dangerous for our lunches. The snow was wet up to here, up to above the knees, and I was afraid for the avalanche, so I went back. And I did decide I will not stay on Everest to acclimatize because it's too dangerous. And I went north to Tibet, where the monsoon is not reaching. And there I climbed smaller peaks, only 7,000 meter peaks, to acclimatize. I went back, and on the middle of August, the weather changed. It became cold and quite good weather. And so I decided now I go after two days of, of cold weather, because I know now the snow is getting hard. Now I, I started in the advanced space camp, and a little bit after midnight, I went very high up the first day, up to seven, eight. It's incredible, very high up. I had also very good conditions, good snow conditions. And from there, it was much more difficult that the snow conditions were not so good. And I needed a long day for 400 meters only. Also because I had to look for the route and not every time I was able to find it directly. I had to go a little bit back, left, right. Speed is generally the, the key for high altitude climbing. Quicker you go up, better it is, because you cannot get high altitude sick. But you have to s climb down the same day at least halfway. If you stay after climbing very quickly up, high up, it's quite surely the, the, fin the end. And on the way up, I knew that I would find the summit, because you go up, it, if it's going up, it's going up. So you crawl upwards. But on the way down, I needed my, my foot uh, prints. Otherwise, I would not have the smallest chance to come back. And it was slightly snowing and these clouds everywhere, sometimes a hole I could see down to the, to the glaciers. And so I was, I was looking back, the footprints are still there, otherwise on the way down it's dangerous, but I could find them, so I found my tent again. 
So three days for going up and two days for going down, five days. I was very quick, much quicker than I was thinking. Tom Hornbein, a member of the first American expedition to Summit Everest, told Outside Magazine, like Copernicus, Mesner had conceived a whole new way of seeing his world. He transformed mountaineering as we know it. John Krakauer called Mesner's 1980 solo climb of Everest a deed widely regarded as the greatest mountaineering feat of all time. The climbing community, when uh, Messner did the solo climb of Everest, thought that, you know, he was the most phenomenal climber of all time. I mean, he proved it. People knew he was phenomenal up till that point, but this really set it in stone. Here's something that this guy did that probably will never be done again, or could not be done again. It was there that he put it all together, and I, I think that solo ascent of Everest was one of the great achievements of all time. Mesner would go on to be the first climber to summit all 14 of the world's 8,000-meter peaks without using bottled oxygen. Mesner grew up in the village of Vilnos in the South Tyrol, where he and his brother Gunter began climbing together from early childhood. We were um, a group of brothers, climbers, uh, friends, and we did the most craziest things in the, in the Alps together. And we both, uh, with climbing, we ran also away from this narrow, dark, South Tyrolean mountain world. It was a, not a nice world in which we came up. My father coming home from the war and being unhappy with most of the Germans, understandably, he was not a German, he was an Italian. These South Tyrolians, German-speaking Italians, 86% of the South Tyrolians voted for Hitler. They were willing to leave this home place, this beautiful country, and to go north, east. Incredible. But anyway, they decided. So they became all Germans. And most of them, they were thinking they do something good, positive. And on the end, they were disparate. They lost their young years. They knew that they did wrong. They knew it was the most terrible uh, political system ever. And I think also that my father brought us to climb. He was a climber before the World War. Not a good one, but he was able to climb. With a few uh, other guys in the same valley, they died in the war. He was alone after the war. So he had no, nobody with, to climb with. And he, to forget the war, to uh, remember only the positive side of the 30s, of the climbing period, he went with us to climb. But we had not his biography. We had another biography. You have to imagine we had no car. We had bicycles later. Uh, in the valley, there was no football place, no, not either a swimming pool. I didn't learn to swim up to now. No swimming pool in the whole valley. So we had only the trees and the mountains. And we had this possibility to climb the mountains and the father let us go. When I did my first climbs, I was especially amazed and fascinated by the fact that I could see a much bigger world. Living in a, in a narrow valley, and seeing the trees and the rocks above and seeing a little bit of the sky where the clouds came and they disappeared a few minutes later, this was my world. And standing the first time as a five-year-old child on a 3,000 meter peak and seeing a huge world, a new cosm, I understood this is great, the world is great, but there was a horizon against somewhere. And I was beginning to seek to know what's behind the next horizon. Mesner will tell you he survived a lifetime on the cutting edge of climbing because of instincts learned in the Dolomites from the age of five. I am not better and not quicker and not uh, more intelligent than the others. Uh, they are much better climbers than me. But uh, I had 15 years between five and 20 where I could approach easily, naively, the mountains. And then I learned everything. I had this instinct, uh, which I got as a small boy. And I think this is the only thing I have more than the others. That I was lucky, lucky. They brought me in the mountains and I became a mountain climber in this way. And not only that I was liking to go to climb, I was so fascinated by climbing. I was dreaming about climbing with eight years old, with nine years old. I was seeking the whole winter for the summer times to go again up to this, these rocks. And when we were 15, 16, we did the first, first ascents, really first ascents, new lines, new routes. 
He and his brother Gunter climbed together from their earliest childhood. But Gunter's death on their first Himalayan climb has haunted Mesner all his life. The Nagapaba situation of 70, the worst I, I had in my life, I think that if a thousand climbers would be in, in the same uh, trap, maybe one would ex escape. If you take the thousand best climbers of all times, if I would be in again in the same trap, I would not survive because I had my chance and I, I survived. On July 27th, 1970, Reinhold and Gunther achieved the seemingly impossible summit of the Rupal face of 26,600-foot Nanga Parbat in Pakistan, the highest rock and ice wall in the world. But Gunther suffered severe altitude sickness, and during their descent, he was swept away by an avalanche after Reinhold had left him to search for a viable route down. Do you suppose that because you two brothers were so close, your brother might have died in your place? And might that have given you a different attitude towards death? I have a different attitude towards death in general because of mountain climbing and also perhaps because of my brother's death. Even though I still have the feeling that he's still alive, and not just in dreams, but say when I look at the mountains we climb together, and that welded us together so intensely that we can never be separated again. I don't have the feeling that he died in my place. I have the feeling that I myself died on that expedition. How did you break the news to your mother? I needed long years to, to, not to digest, to live with the fact that my brother died on Nanka Papa. This was my responsibility, or my co-responsibility. Surely, Papa was also his. And uh, still now, I'm living with it, but I'm living in, in harmony with it. I understand it, and it's a fact, and uh, my brother is still living with me. I speak sometimes in half, in half sleeping with him, and I imagine what he would do now, what we would do together, maybe not, yes. Know anything about Mesner, and you're not surprised to learn that he returned to Nanga Parbat eight years later to make his first solo attempt on an 8,000-meter peak. He did it alone on a very difficult route, and also it was an idea he had and had tried to do several times. And he went and he, and he at some points and felt, well, I don't have the mental strength to do this, and he'd go home. And then he went again, and he failed, and he went home. I don't know that everybody realizes, I mean, I don't even know how many times he tried each peak before he got up. The thing that makes him good is his judgment. He's got so much experience. He's been in the mountains so much, and he's tried these peaks so many times that he's got good judgment, and that allowed him to eventually get up them and also to get up them and still be alive. He finally, I think on the third trip to Nanga Parbat, he had his act together mentally, and he did this climb. So that's probably why. It's something he had thought about for years, and he finally did it. If I speak about history, there is no doubt this is Sir Ernest Shackleton. He's my hero. He was the greatest of the adventurer of, of the modern times, not speaking about the Greece times and the Roman times. But I don't like the classical heroes. I like much more um, broken down uh, people like Shackleton. He never succeeded, but how he failed, it's great. From the modern people, I think the most important uh, mountaineer of the last 50 years is Chris Bonington. No doubt. He did so many things in, in a long period between the 50s up to the last years. He's still climbing very well. I'm of an older generation and I mean, quite honestly, I don't put myself remotely in the same class as Massimo. I mean, I, I think he's arguably the greatest climber of all time. I look for beautiful places, and this I bought many years ago, 20 years ago, 
I bought it for thirty thousand dollars. The whole place. Nobody was willing to buy it. Everybody was thinking this is breaking down. These castles had no value. And I got it, and I needed a few years, and I put in all my money in this period to restore it. And afterwards, it became my home place. Mesner's castle is located in northern Italy, on the eastern edge of the Dolomites, outside of the lovely town of Murano, known for its healing mineral springs. When my children had to go to school, we decided, my wife and myself, we will move to Merano in the winter time, in the school months, for 10 months, that they can go to school nearby. And in this moment, I decided by myself to handle this castle. I will open it to the public, and it should be self-sufficient. And it was self-sufficient the first year. It's not costing me anything. One focus of Mesner's life now lies across the Dolomites near the famous ski and rock climbing capital of Italy, Cortina, on a mountain pass called Monte Rite. In this period of my life, I would like to uh, bring home the heritage of mountaineering, of climbing. This was a fortification in the First World War, built by the Italians. And afterwards, nobody came anymore here, up to 89 when I came and I found this, and said, this is a good place for a Dolomite museum. Now, I think the people, they need more background information, but not only uh, scientific information. They need especially emotions to understand why the mountains are important, what are the values of the mountains. Like, uh, I will speak about the silence, about the, the emptiness. And these values are, are lost. Inside in the museum, you see a different face of the mountains. And with this, I hope that the people are going out of the museum and their eye changed. And they will go and see the mountains in a different way and their respect for them will grow. These glass houses are crystals. And uh, the architect Faccio, who is the architect of this museum, had the idea to change these uh, crystals and uh, they should remember also that we are in the mountains and around this museum we have 360 degrees of the most beautiful mountains of the Dolomites which are the most beautiful mountains of the world. With this new approach, this is more than a book. It's, it's a different approach than a book. In a book, I can tell stories. People can read it or not read it. But here, they are forced to have emotions. And I will combine this every, every year new, the combination. I'm only the combiner. I'm not an artist. I'm not able to do a painting. I'm not able to do music. With the combination, I found out that the people are going in and they, they go out and they say, I understand now. I, I know now but they know with the heart and not with the head. You know, there, there is a film, a film done in the 30s, with the title, The Call of the Mountains. But I'm not believing that mountains are calling. Mountains are silent and quiet, and this is the arena of the loneliness, what is up there. Reinhold, here you sit naked before us, vulnerable. I'd like to ask you a very simple question and just as naked. What was the point of all this? I don't know. I've never asked myself why I do it. 
That goes for the other crazy things I've done in my life. I wouldn't know the answer. I have the feeling every now and then that I can write on those large rock faces that are three or four thousand meters high. Like a teacher writes on a blackboard with chalk. But I don't just write lines, imaginary lines. I live those lines. I also have the feeling that afterwards those lines are still there, even if I'm the only one who can feel them, see them, because I lived them, and nobody else will ever be able to see them. But they're there, and they'll be there for all time. Mesner gave a similar description of climbing 19 years later. A climb is only there for me. If I climb up a, a wall, there is a line. Before, during, and afterwards. And this line is really done. But afterwards, you see nothing on the wall. I see in my inner eye my line. This is a huge design, maybe the biggest uh, uh, paintings we do on the high, high faces on Aconcagua south face, on Everest southwest face. But we, la we leave nothing. We leave really nothing because the next generation can come and they don't see a line on Everest and on Nanga Parbat and so on. And I think that uh, the biggest possibility on this world we have is to create the nothing, but to create something, the nothing. So the next generations, they have the world still empty and they can fill it up. But if they again leave nothing forever, uh, human beings are forced to be creative and to do something to bring them in with all their abilities. And so they have uh, a strong sense in living. If you are there and the whole world is prepared, it's much more important to have nothing and to, uh, to create something. But if we create something real, on the end, the next generations can do nothing because everything is done. And I think we invent the world in each generation again and we, we live it step by step. The life is lived step by step. Only this moment during doing the step, the, the way is there. Afterwards, there is nothing. The wind is bringing away my footprints. And uh, we don't never know exactly uh, where this way is, is bringing us. The intersection of life and adventure is never far away in a conversation with Reinhold Mesner. A profession you learn. You learn in school, you learn uh, in university, and afterwards you handle it. And you get maybe also a diploma and you can walk with it. Uh, adventuring is totally different. You can only learn it doing it. And you are not never a professional because you never know everything. Because you need in adventure the unknown. And if you, there is unknown, you cannot know to handle it. So you are faced in each adventure again with new problems. And on the spot you have to decide and do it. To survive, to die, to handle it. And for this is only a, a, a condition. You, you, you are in an in a adventure condition. You have the heart of an adventurer during doing it. I am having a huge problem. From all these climbers of this generation, I came out as a known person in a, in a large public, in a larger public. And not all of them, but many of them, after a while understood they have only one chance to um, compete, to use me. And it's very easy to use me in, in a bad and in a good way. And most of them, they became very weak when a ghostwriter came or a manager came and said, let me handle it. I handle your person. I make you famous. I make you rich. We do it selling your uh, figure, Peter's figure, Fuchs's figure, whoever, on the shoulders of Messner. When Peter Habler published his account of their 1978 Everest climb, he described Mesner as having completely broken down after his snow blindness set in. He was completely confused, Habler wrote, and was suffering hallucinations, completely helpless and reliant on my guidance. I can carry many people, but it's not possible if I carry them and they shit on me. And this is happening normally. They never climbed together again, and Mesner still has not forgiven him.
I try to be very, very truthful, also to myself. So I'm telling things which many people are do not, they don't like to read. I'm not uh, here for telling what the people like to hear or to, to listen to or to read. I'm telling what's my experience, what is my view. I'm very critical with, with the climbing machine because I see that many things I don't like, so I, I say it. There is no heroic man on this world. We are all normal people and our possibilities are very, very small. And because our possibilities are very small, we are running 100 meters in the best of the world in nine seconds and something. There are horses, they are going double as quick. The polar bears, they can cross the Arctic Ocean without a tent, without sleeping bag, without a cooker, without GPS, without anything. They are much better than we are. Uh, the, the certain uh, animals can climb up vertical overhanging walls without anything. They go up. We are really not able to do any great thing. And for this fact, because we are not weak, our skin is not thick, we have no uh, long hairs against the cold, our lungs are nothing. There are uh, birds, they can fly at 11,000 meters in a huge velocity because they, their lungs are able to, to handle it. We are not able to handle 8,000 meters I mean, for a few hours, but maximum. We are really not uh, great built, but because we are so weak in many uh, sites, we invented our intelligence, especially because we were afraid 100,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago, when the lions and the tigers were there and the polar bears came and human beings had to learn to, to handle it and the fires all, all over. So they learned to become intelligent, slowly, through fear and the fact that they were not intelligent, uh, not uh, able in, uh, in an animalistic way. And with the intelligence, we are able to handle everything. And we became the strongest uh, group of animals on this world. There is no stronger reality than mountains or wilderness, generally. This is reality. The storm, the rockfall, the, the difficult ground. But going to Everest or going also on a hill like this, you see and you feel, you smell the danger. And this is there. The danger is always there. You can hear it when, when the it's lightning is coming. And you learn quite quickly in your life as a small boy or as a small girl, if you go in in wilderness, a few steps, again a few steps back, how to handle it. And this is great. I think that up to my last days, I will go, if the time is there, out to the mountains, out to the wilderness, to be in reality, in the real reality. It's very strange that I'm seeking for getting older. I know that it's, it's not so easy to be old. Still now I have only a, a, a few problems with one leg and uh, my memory is not anymore like it was before. So I feel the fact that I'm getting older and older. But uh, getting older means also to get freer. It's not more necessary to go into an expedition to have a success. I did everything what I had to do. There is no famous climbers on the world because climbing is an activity which nobody is following. It's not football or, or rugby or golf or tennis. We are quite unknown, but it was my way to order the world for myself and it was my way to express myself. I needed the possibility to express myself, not with words, also with going up a rock wall. And uh, we are on the world more or less to express ourselves and to order our own world. And more we cannot do in this life. It's not important what we have at the end. It's only important what we have done, but not what we have. And I am still functioning this way. I'm willing to uh, spend everything for a project. All my money, all my time, all my energy, all my enthusiasm to do it. And afterwards I can say, it was not necessary, but it was great.